If you're following along with us in the hardcover book, we're on page 287 uh, for glory is God's ultimate end. Mm. So uh, Christian says that even though ex- evil uh, in, is an institution within God's good creation, it was not unexpected. Right. So, so it's kind of, right, it kind of intruded. It wasn't really, you know, it doesn't seem like it fits and that sort of thing. But, uh, but it, yeah, God yeah. wasn't surprised by it. Right. right. The, 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 the serpent didn't escape his, uh, his <laughs> confines. And, That's right. Slithered by God right. and God missed him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, in between his meetings with, with Adam and Eve, he, uh, he, he doesn't uh, step out for a phone call and it comes back and everything's on fire. <laughs> it was not a risk that God took in order to preserve the libertarian free will of his creatures. Uh, Christensen has set forth uh, that before and you can find previous episodes where we discuss libertarian free will and um, how it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, biblically minded. It certainly did not catch God by surprise as though God could be subject to such a thing as surprise. Mm. It's one of uh, the things that make God's God, he's not surprised unless you're open theist or some some weird thing like that. As we have already seen, it stands within the sovereign decree of God, and we covered this in chapters uh, 7, 8, 9. This explains the fact of evil, but it does not explain the why of evil. Yeah, good. So there it is, right? It's It exists. Right. Right. Now what? <laughs> yeah. And so Christians tells us that, uh, you know, because its presence is so contrary to our moral sensibilities, that is the presence of evil, right, which are derived from God himself, we're sorely inclined to think that evil somehow diminishes the good purposes of God. That's the way it feels to us, mm-hmm. right, because of that. And thus to understand God's purpose, he tells us in decreeing evil, we must kind of step back and look at his ultimate objective, right? That's what he suggests right. so, yeah. in order to get a feel for this and understand it and perceive what God is attempting to do. Right. right? The Bible talks about uh, sin, uh, separation from God, separating ourselves as people of God from sin or the world. Uh, there seems to be uh, a two sides uh, a version of this, and uh, God seems to be on on um, you know this this one side, and He's uh, either uh, reacting or He's uh, He's He's having to to deal with this this hatred that He has for things out in the world that aren't His or aren't. Um, you know, aren't, aren't the way that he wants it. That's right. Yeah. So uh, God has a, uh, a manifold purpose in creation and providence, uh, purposes whose wide regions can never be fully charted. But all such lesser goals are subordinate ends to God's ultimate end. So what's the, the main purpose? So you can have all these kind of secondary uh, minor purposes or secondary qualities of, of, of why evil exists, but what's the ultimate end? And that's to bring glory to himself and everything he does. Mm. The magnif- magnification of God's glory is his ultimate purpose in creating the world. Right. Not just evil, the world in general. Right. God doesn't have to create the world. The, the world isn't uh, a necessary condition in of itself. Uh, God doesn't uh, learn love by creating the world or, or learn anything or there's nothing that God is missing by not creating. He uh, uh, creates so that he can uh, magnify his glory to Ex- express yeah. himself, right. Right. which he didn't have to do, yeah. but he does so. Yeah. And so throughout scripture, uh, God's passion for his glory, uh, Christensen tells us is paramount, right? This is uh, his, uh, so he quotes Bruce Ware and uh, Ware puts it like this from the first verse of inspired scripture to the last chapter of revelation, God makes clear in 10,000 ways that the greatest value in the universe and the final end of all of life is the uncontested supremacy and unrivaled glory of, uh, of God alone, right? So God is eternally self-existent. Uh, he's self-sufficient, right? In the fullness of the unchanging perfections of his own Trinitarian being, and therefore he doesn't need to, as you mentioned, exp- you know, display his glory, but he's chosen to do that, right? Right. right. So that's, that's one of the reasons uh, also why um, the Trinity is such a good expl- explainer of who God is, because unlike other uh, monotheistic ideas. Um, uh, love seems to be a, a character quality that uh, is expressed or, or is talked about within those other religions. But it seems like in order to love something, he has to be in a relationship with, and therefore he has to make without being uh, a, a trinity uh, to uh, make something and express love and 
do it perfectly. So it seems to be a need that he must have creation in order to express it to that. Whereas a Trinity, uh, he loves each member of the God. Yeah, love already exists. Right. It's nothing that he has to create first and then so that he's able to, to participate right. in it. He already, for all eternity, has already participated in love. Exactly. All right. Yeah. So, nor does he have any need to manifest his glory to us. It's, it's not a need that he must do. His glory has been perfectly manifested between members of the Trinity from all eternity, John 17, 5. Nonetheless, the triune God so delights in his own glory, expressed in the inner Trinitarian relationships, that he desired to turn to express the overflow of that delight towards the creature he freely made, especially those made in his image. Right. And again, this is, we talked about this before, but... It seems to be something that you would actually want from a being such as this. Uh, you, you would want a being to reveal himself, to save us, to uh, magnify his glory so that you know who he is. And the fact that um, we talk about God as you know, unsearchable and unchangeable and uh, uh, this uh, aboveness, uh, it's, it's, it's always this uh, transcendent nature, uh, it, it seems uh, difficult to grasp, and we would also expect that as well. Mm, mm, yeah. So what is this glory? Right? What in the world are we talking about here? Well, Christensen tells us that God's glory can be defined as that unworldly divine <laughs> transcendence that dwarfs our position as creatures before the creator. He says it speaks to the weight and worth of God, right? And it, it encompasses the full panorama of the supremacy and unity of his divine attributes, right? Uh, it says that he is preeminent in existence and that the whole universe is filled with, uh, with the evidence of his importance and his solemnity. Right. And so the entire universe uh, is an explosion of God's glory. He quotes the psalmist here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. And that's in Psalm uh, 104. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other day, I, I was uh, going through the the uh, human depravity that is uh, Twitter, and uh, there was a, a, someone saying like, "Oh, you're telling me that God, you know, made this universe with you know so many millions of light years and so many uh, particles and so many planets, and you know, at the very center of this is you and you're special." And the Christian response is, "Yes, <laughs> yes, that, that that's that's how amazing He is, is that He can make all of this and yet make something specific and." intimate and focused and uh, the, the, the other things magnify that glory even more. So it's not just, Oh, we're so special because we're this, the only planet that God created. No, no, it's the only planet he created with where he put his image into it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from there we're to expand out. 